Okay, let's go. So, uh, if you think about it, one reoccurring theme in mathematics is if you really love something, you try to do it backwards, right? Mm -hmm. Differentiation, integration. We love functions, we talk about inverse functions, you know? So, I figured, uh, since we love trig substitution so much, why not try to do that backwards? It's just like, it's amazing. Okay, so, uh, we're going to look at another integration technique today. It's called the Weierstrass substitution. for you German fans. Uh, it's a German mathematician in, from the 1800s. And this substitution refers to something that, like I said, it's kind of like the reverse of trick substitution. You know, trick substitution, you have a rational function and you apply a substitution to turn it into a trig function. Let's do the opposite. Suppose I give you a trig function, is there a way to turn it into a rational function? It turns out that a lot of times there is. Um, so here's the substitution. Set. Some people use t, but I'm going to use u. Set u equals the tangent of the half angle x. Okay. Now, once you start out with that substitution, certain things kind of uh, follow uh, consequently. So, for example, if you look at du, that's going to be one half the secant squared of x over two. Uh, by the Pythagorean identity, that's actually 1 plus tangent squared dx, dx. Uh, but since tangent of x over 2 is u, uh, this is just 1 plus u squared. And so you end up with dx being equal to uh, 2 over 1 plus u squared du. So that's going to be an important substitution. And now let's actually look for the other trig functions. If tangent of x over 2 is u, this means you can have this uh, sort of triangle that you can set up with x over 2 is the angle here. The opposite is u. The adjacent is 1. This would be the radical 1 plus u squared. This would mean that if you want to find the sine of x over 2, that's just opposite over hypotenuse. And if you look at the cosine of x over 2, that's adjacent over hypotenuse. So this means if you want to find the sine function, you can just think of this as a double angle of x over 2. So that's going to be 2 times sine of x over 2 times cosine of x over 2. And that's going to be 2 times this times that. That's going to give you 2u over 1 plus this should be u squared. 1 plus u squared. And if you look at the cosine, uh, this you can use the double angle formula as well. So you have cosine squared minus sine squared. And that's going to be uh, 1 over 1 plus u squared minus u squared over 1 plus u squared or 1 minus u squared over 1 plus u squared. You can also find the tangent. And this is going to be, well, it's sine over cosine. So I'm going to take this guy divided by that guy. The 1 plus u squares are going to cancel. And I would have that. And the others, I'm, I'm not really going to do any examples of the other trig functions, but the other trig functions can be found similarly. Or at least found using the above. So uh, if you want to find cosecant, just it's 1 over that. It's going to be 1 plus u squared over 2u. And the secant is going to be 1 over that, 1 plus u squared over 1 minus u squared. And the cotangent is just going to be 1 over that, 1 minus u squared over 2u. So um, what we ultimately gain is, so let's just 
just put it over here. Uh, so if you set u equals tangent of x over 2, this means that your dx is going to be equal to uh, the 2 over 1 plus u squared du. You'd all so get that your sine x is going to be equal to the guy over there, which is 2u over 1 plus u squared. You'll also get that your cosine x is 1 minus u squared over 1 plus u squared, and you will get that your tangent x is equal to uh, 2 u over 1 minus u squared. So let's just leave these guys up here. Um, we'll be using those. Right? So you just make this one little substitution, and all of these guys kind of fall into place. And what you will notice is that basically I can think of all the trig functions as a bunch of rational functions. And in some situations, that is going to be very convenient. Well, what kind of situations, you might ask? Good question. Uh, let's look at this integral. <coughs> let's look at how that would break down via a Weierstrass substitution. set u equals the tangent of x over 2. This means that uh, i is automatically going to break down into certain components. I can replace the sine function with this guy. And I can replace the dx with this guy. So this integral, which was once a trig integral, uh, now it's, it's purely a rational function. Because now I can multiply these across. This is going to be 2 over 1 plus u squared plus 2u. Which is, uh, that's uh, surprisingly not bad. This is actually u plus 1 all squared. And what's the integral of that? <coughs> what's the integral of 2 over u plus 1 all squared? So this would end up being minus 2 over u plus 1 plus c. Or in other words, this is minus 2. And it's a lot easier than a trick substitution. You can literally directly back substitute here. Uh, tangent of x over 2 uh, plus 1. So that was a Weierstrass substitution. Um, See? Kind of like reversing a trick sum. Uh, go from the trig case to the rational function case as opposed to vice versa. That can be pretty nice. Question, uh, just to see. This one is actually not so bad even if we didn't know about Weierstrass substitution. Let's say I gave you that guy and before today. How would you have uh, attacked that guy? <coughs> How would you do ideas?
So idea is to integrate 1 over 1 plus sine x using our previous methods. Like if you saw that before today, you would have tried it. Multiplying one minus sine x and make new it and denominator. That actually seems like a pretty smart move. Let's see what uh, would actually end up here. Uh, one plus sine x, uh, one minus sine x over one minus sine x. Uh, what would we end up with here? Um, one minus sine x and cos squared x. Jumping. Yeah. And then you can do you substitution you equals this. Oh, that's, 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 that's not a square. Yeah, that's you just equals to sine x. And you equals sine x? No? Yeah. yeah, couldn't work directly though. Something else. Huh? What? U equals 1 minus sine No, if u equals 1 minus sine x, the d would be cosine x, and I don't have a cosine x. So that's not what I'm seeing. But if you let u equals cosine x, your d u would be sine x, but there's a 1 here. So what are we doing? Oh, we just huh? separate it. Yeah, separate it. So it's the 1 over cosine squared, which is a secant squared, minus uh, mm -hmm. the sine x over cosine squared x. And I do a u sub on this part, and that part we actually just know what that is. So. The integral of sine squared is just tangent because the derivative of tangent is secant, secant squared. And then here, if we do a u equals cosine, the d is going to be minus sine x dx. We'll end up with minus 1 over u squared, which when we integrate that, we would end up with minus 1 over uh, cosine x. So is sine x over cosine squared x the same as secant tan? And we could just do it the same as the secant squared? Just because secant tan is. Yes, that, that's also fine. Okay. So you could look at this as sine over cosine is going to be tangent, and the 1 over cosine left over is secant. So you could directly go back to secant here. Or, yeah, we have a couple options here, e equals cosine. Uh, in either way, uh, we get 1 over cosine, which is secant. Now, uh, these two answers are actually equivalent. I believe they're, they're exactly trig identities, but if not, they will differ by a constant. Um, and you'll realize that if you were to differentiate either of these expressions, you would actually end up with 1 over 1 plus sine x uh, verification left to the reader. But yeah, that's the way you would have done it without it. Uh, here's another example, though, which this one is kind of uh, a little bit sketchier, even though overall it's not much different on the surface, if we throw in uh, two uneven coefficients uh, and a negative sign. Then yeah, we can probably get away with that by other means, something similar to what we do here. But now, I don't think there's really a clear winner for who would be easier to come up with. Um, because of the, the uneven things here. You'll end up with, if you get the cosine squared, you'll end up with like a number plus the cosine squared in the denominator here, um, which uh, can be a little bit annoying. Right? So if you think if you had 1 over uh, cosine squared plus 1 or something like that, uh, that's actually going to be a little bit annoying to get around. So here, uh, the wire stress substitution does have, at least from my point of view, a clear benefit. Uh, if we set uh, u equals tangent of x over 2, then our integral is going to become 
uh, 1 over 3 minus, going to plug in this first line. So that's uh, going to be 4 uh, u over 1 plus u squared. And my dx is going to be uh, 2 over 1 plus u squared. This is going to multiply out to uh, 3 plus 3u squared minus 4u du. Okay, how do we deal with this one? for dealing with this one. <clears throat> See something like that, what do you think? What would you try first? Seems like a uh, does it factor? Mm -hmm. Huh? Because it would be like three u and u, and what would we have to have? Like to get this, it'd have to be a three and a one, and that's not going to work out. You can't put the three here because three is not a common term. Three here is going to give you a nine and a one. So um, it doesn't work to factor here, although uh, that would be my first thought uh, to try to factor it and do a partial fractions. Knowing that it doesn't factor, what, what now? Doesn't factor, what, what other option do you have? Yeah? Oh, complete the square and do the trick stuff. Complete the square and do a trick stuff. Right? Now, the question is, are we going to end up in a better trick situation than we started with? Uh, well, let's see. We can uh, take this 3 out. And if I were to complete the square on this, what would I need to happen? How would it go? What does this become? U <coughs> squared minus 4 over 3u. Uh, <coughs> what would we add and subtract? is two-thirds, then you're going to square it, so you're going to get four-ninths, and you subtract four-ninths. So these three here becomes uh, pretty much the u plus u minus u minus uh, two-thirds all squared. And then I have the minus four-ninths left over, So what we have here is a 2 over 3 times u minus 2 third squared. Uh, this will be minus 4 over 3 plus 3, which I can think of that as 9 over 3. So this will become... Five 
controversy. So this one's a bit of a mess. Then now you can do a trick sub. I don't know. I would think of this as the radical of 3 all squared. And so I can think of radical 3 u minus uh, 2 over radical 3 set that equal to what would be the trick sub here? 5 over 3 tangent theta your radical 3 du would be equal to radical 5 over 3 and squared theta theta and so your du would be uh, <coughs> 5 over 9 secant squared theta d theta let's see if this actually yields something nicer uh, so this is going to be equal to 2 over the du is going to be radical 5 over 9 second squared theta d theta. And here, we're going to have 5 over 3. This guy here would give us a tangent squared plus 1, which is going to be a secant squared. Everything's right, and this would cancel that. And so we have 2 times 3 over 5 times radical 5 over 9 integral. Just d theta. So that goes into that 3 times. This goes into that radical 5 times. And so we end up with. 2 over 3 radical 5, and that's theta plus c. Now your theta is going to be what? Theta is going to be tan inverse of this monstrosity over here. It will be 3 over radical 5. times u minus two-thirds. Let's see. And our u is just a tangent of x over 2. So this is uh, 3 over radical 5 tangent x over 2 minus 2 thirds. So Weierstrass isn't immune to needing extra help from other techniques. So at any given time, you should have all the techniques in mind and you kind of use them uh, whenever convenient. So have another situation. Any questions so far in general or specific? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it would be red 5 over 3 instead of 9 in the DU. Uh, I don't know here? Change the answer yet. Here? Yeah. Yes, the, when you bring them down the three squares, but they're under a radical, so that should be three. This should be three. Which, uh, we're going to be off by a constant here. That should be a three, which means this should be a three which means there is no 3 here, right? Do we miss, did we miss anything else? Does that fix it?
maybe after this one, I'll, I'll leave you guys with a couple of dry uh, sign notes. another way to do this one as well but let's uh, actually just run through it with uh, this technique over here set u equals tangent x over 2 uh, this means our integral would look like the sine function is going to look like 2u over 1 plus u squared tangent function is going to look like 2u over 1 minus u squared. And the dx function is going to look like 2 over 1 plus u squared d. So this is going to be equal to, if I multiply that out, I would get 2 over 2u uh, plus 2u1 plus u squared over 1 minus u squared du. Uh, to simplify that, I would probably just uh, multiply and divide by the LCD to change this to a simpler, simpler fraction. It's not going to be simple, but. So, what I'm going to do here. multiply and divide by 1 minus e squared. So in the bottom I have 2u times 1 minus e squared plus 2u times 1 plus u squared du. Let's clean this up a bit. Uh, we can factor out a 2 from the top of 1 minus u squared. Over here I'm going to have 2u minus 2u cubed plus 2u plus 2u cubed du. These guys are going to die and I would end up having 4u under here. Uh, but that can come out and become a half, so it's 1 minus u squared over u. Right? Any arithmetic errors here? Uh, and so that's 1 half times, of course, 1 over u minus u du. Just do a direct back substitution. So our u is tangent of x over 2. So here we have uh, another option. In the event that we have a uh, like a trig function where it's not clear that some of our other rules that I told you about when we we're doing the trig integral section um, would actually work. Sometimes you can maneuver things, uh, like in the first example, multiplying by a 1 minus sine x on the top and bottom actually uh, did the trick. Sometimes it's a little bit more complicated, um, but now when you have some trig functions and things are kind of complicated, this is another uh, system that you can use. <coughs> I have to go through a little bit of algebra, but usually, um, especially for the simpler problems, once you actually clean that up, things are going to be relatively nice, um, or at least nice enough for you to use uh, previous techniques, usually. Uh, so this is the wire stress substitution. Uh, here are some more examples for you to try on your own. Uh, we'll probably do them next time. Uh, can I, I should probably erase over that first.
This one you could uh, actually try it by another means. A similar thing, multiplying and divide by 1 minus <coughs> cosine 2x uh, would actually kill it, but uh, try this one. And here is another, this should be an interesting exercise. So it's just the integral of secant, which we know how to do that, but uh, you use the wire struts. You already know how to do it the other way. And prove your answer is equivalent. Yes. To that one, should it be tangent squared over four? Uh, yeah. Oh, that, yeah. class, you would have Get in parentheses. Uh, yeah, that's nice. Try those. Yeah, I know we have nice ways to do these already, but uh, just to get used to the other technique in somewhat of familiar context. And if you also have a nice way to do this, yeah, you can let me know what you think of who would actually do that. Uh, that being said. Let's move on to uh, another topic. Um, I'm going to skip 7.7 .7 for now because we kind of have a momentum of computing integrals going that I don't want to mess up. Uh, so we're going to jump to the next section and we'll do 7.7, .7, I believe. Uh, after we finish this, we're going to talk about improper intervals. And by the way, this uh, is a handout that covers what we'll do once we finish improper intervals. We're going to look at some approximate integration. So this is for next time. Probably Thursday. Probably by Thursday we'll start doing this. Now, some of these you already know the midpoint rule, right hand and left hand rule. Uh, but the trapezoidal rule and Simpson's rule is probably new and you haven't seen it before. Uh, so we'll go over those as well as talk about some errors and how we can actually use these. We'll go through these examples over here. Um, but again, it's a very different field. It's more like going back to Riemann sums, and it's kind of a different field than computing integrals, how we've been computing it. So I, I just want to skip over this section, go into another section that's more familiar uh, to what we've been doing this whole time. And once we're that's out of the way, then we will uh, come back to this step. So bring this next time, and just keep it in your notebook for now. Yeah. Oh, 
you guys don't want the board at the house. about improper intervals. What are they? Where do they come from? What do they want? Improper intervals. Uh, so, we're kind of on a first name basis, so if you call it the FC, it's TC. How to compute uh, something like this? It should go from a to b of f of x dx, and what it means. Right. So we knew that we could interpret this as the net area under the curve f of x on the interval a b, and we can compute it using what's called the antiderivative of little f, which is another function that if we were differentiating, we get little f. We can do it by plugging in the top limit into that function and minus the bottom limit into that, into the same function. Uh, and that was the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, one thing you might not remember specifically, but it is, uh, it is actually important to the theorem and how it was proved and how you actually looked at it. Um, in the FTC, though, one we assume a b is some interval of finite length. And two, we also assume that f of x is continuous on a b. Now, only one direction of the fundamental, th only one part of the fundamental theorem of calculus needs continuity. But in Calc 1, we usually assume everything is continuous, so we don't really have to worry about uh, certain uh, minutia. Um, but what if one or both of these conditions? I see. I was very uncomfortable with one of these failing. Uh, uh, one, uh, was I didn't say one? One thing that can happen if one or both uh, fail is we can obtain something called an improper integral. And let me just say specifically what that is. Uh, consider the integral from a to b of f of x dx equals i. We call I improper if uh, three conditions, which can be mixed and matched, by the way. If our A equals negative infinity, and or our B equals positive infinity, and or f of x is not continuous at a finite number of points in a b. So once we assume that the interval can be infinitely long, or our function is not going to work at certain spots in that interval, uh, and any or all of these can be occurring at the same time, we get what we call an improper integral. So 
let's actually just write down what some of these uh, would look like. So they walk around, they look like regular integrals, but if you're not paying attention, you might be fooled. Uh, Part of the stress of uh, being a Calc 1 professor is not putting an improper integral by accident on a, on a Calc 1 test, because um, it's, it's surprisingly easy. Um, well, not in certain obvious cases. Obviously, once infinity pops up, you're like, yeah, that's fine. But sometimes uh, it doesn't have to. So uh, things that are improper, something like uh, 1 to infinity, uh, 1 over x dx. Kind of obvious that that's improper. Um, but let's uh, continue. Minus infinity, infinity. And you'd be surprised. These guys uh, pop up all the time. They're actually very useful in all sorts of applications. Um, and we'll actually talk about them later when we deal with series. They'll actually be uh, very useful in um, helping us compute certain series. This one's super important. And it's also super hard to compute this integral on a finite uh, interval length. But it turns out when it's infinity, you can actually get the exact answer pretty, uh, pretty easily. Relatively easily, let's say. I'll probably do that with you guys later. Even though technically it's probably a little bit out of our scope. The standard way to use a double integral. I'll talk about that. Or at least what that is. Okay, so all of these guys, for example, are right, improper integrals. Here's our non example. So we can actually compare. Okay. Let's see. Are we sure we know why these are improper? Some of them are obvious. Once there's an infinity on your interval, on your integral, uh, that's automatically improper just by nature of uh, points one and two. Now, you'll notice there are some other ones where they don't have infinities on their intervals. Integrals. Uh, why is that improper? Yeah. There's zeros in the set. Uh, zeros in the interval minus one to one, x equals zero. Uh, f not continuous at x equals 0. And 0 is in between minus 1 and 1. Uh, for the similar reason here, our f is not continuous at x equals 2. And 2 is inside of this interval. It's not even visible at the moment. Same as 0 is not visible there. Uh, here, the 0 is a problem because f is not continuous at 0. This is a problem because of the 5, f is not continuous at 5. And what about this one? What's the issue here? So we don't have infinite intervals, but f is not continuous where? 1. Both 1 and negative 1. So there are actually two <laughs> points, and both of those points are in these intervals. So this is an issue. Whenever you're doing a definite integral over things like that, you kind of have to be worried about what that's doing to your area. Uh, because as you know from, again from Calc 1, from curve sketching, these guys, they have asymptotes. They shoot up to infinity um, when you hit these points. And so now you're wondering, well, what's going to happen to the area if my function is shooting off to infinity? And you might automatically think, well, isn't the area going to go off to infinity? And the answer is no. So we're going to actually look at that. <laughs> Which, one or two math classes ago, uh, you might have been surprised at that answer. What? It doesn't go up to infinity? But yeah, again, in Calc 2, we've seen infinite things add up to finite things already. So 
Heck, an integral itself is an infinite Riemann sum, and we know we can actually compute that we get finite answers. So adding up an infinite number of things and getting something finite shouldn't be daunting. So in that same way, uh, you don't always get infinity. Sometimes these things can give you actually bona fide numbers. Um, this one is not improper uh, since f is not continuous at x equals 0, but x equals 0 is not in the interval. So we don't care. If our function misbehaves at some point that we're not looking at, uh, we don't care. Uh, what is a problem is if it misbehaves on the actual interval that we're looking at at the moment. <coughs> There's a famous paradox here. You'll probably hear it. Hear of it. Paradox. It's called the Gabriel's horn. And basically, it's like if you take y equals uh, 1 over x, you look at this guy like that, and you think of it from, say, the point 1 onwards, and you rotate the shaded area around the x-axis. So you can, if you're looking in three dimensions now, maybe I want to go at a different point. So that's the z-axis, that's the x-axis, that's the y-axis, that's the x-axis. You will have, kind of have this circular horn uh, kind of going on forever. And a long time ago, centuries ago, uh, people were really disturbed by this uh, because it turns out the horn uh, has infinite surface area. But Finite volume. Which is kind of crazy. You can fill the horn with paint, but you won't have enough paint to actually paint around the surface of the horn. Which is like, what? Okay. Uh, and it turns out you can actually compute what the volume and the, the uh, area of this are uh, using improper integrals. Uh, because it's literally going on forever. So. You can tell people you've heard about Gabriel's form, that's what it means. Uh, yeah, so you can have a lot of cool things, and it's not just cool things, they do have a lot of nice applications. We'll see some applications even in this class, um, but you'll see even more in further classes. So improper integrals is a very important thing to understand. Uh, how do we actually go about computing them? These are the bad points. We don't want to uh, be near those. Okay. So, uh, since we cannot plug these points into f, uh, because if we're setting up a Riemann sums, the f is going to give us the height of the rectangles, but there are some points where we can't actually find the height of the rectangle because the function either has a hole or an asymptote at that point. Uh, so we'll never actually be able to plug in that point. Uh, but what do we do is we use limits 
yay, lemons are coming back. To approach these points. So, remember everything about limits, including L'Hopital's rule. Uh, if you don't remember all of those things, or you never heard of those things, uh, you can see my Calc 1 videos uh, where I did limits and L'Hopital's rule. So everything about limits you need to remember, everything about limits, because we're going to be applying limits on top of integrals. So, let's actually look at... <clears throat> the process, how it actually breaks down, how do we actually apply this, and we need to break things down in this way to get the Riemann sum set up to work. I'm not going to go back to basics and prove anything from Riemann sums, but this is how it all fleshes out, and this is basically what you need to know to compute things here. One, you're going to split the integrals so that only one bad point is exposed. It's very important that you have it out in the open, right? So you don't want something hidden like uh, the minus two, the two of this guy. No, we understand that we can split integrals, right? Um, I'm going to exposed if necessary. Sometimes the bad point is exposed already, you don't have to worry about it. And of course, here I'm talking about using the fact that we know if you have an integral f from a to b of f of x dx, we can actually write that from a to c of f plus from c to b of f. Right. Using that idea, we can kind of break this in integral up over several intervals. We want to do this so that the bad points are exposed. So here, for example, I can break this up into minus 2 to minus 1 plus minus 1 to 2. Uh, you will notice that there is also a hidden point that's bad here because right? the plus one is going to be a problem over here, and so you would actually split this even further. So you can go minus two to minus one, plus uh, minus one to one, plus uh, one to two. So you'll see this is a bad point. Uh, nobody else on that integral is bad. Uh, the one is a bad point. No one else on that integral is bad. Here, though, what's going on? Two bad points, right? So you have to split it even further. You split this into uh, minus 2 to minus 1 plus, say, minus 1 to 0 plus 0 to 1 plus 1 to 2. Right? You keep splitting it until all the bad points are exposed and you've relegated only one of them per integral. Because what you want to do is you want to set the Riemann sums up where one point is fixed and you start your dissections emanating from that point and then you're going to let a limit push it towards the other point. Because uh, it's mathematically complicated to have like both points expanding while you're trying to set up rectangle. It, it doesn't work out very nicely computationally speaking. And it turns out there are, we'll probably even do case, I'll show you cases where Trying to do that both at once, you can actually get the wrong answer at the end of the day. Let's actually, yeah, so uh, the first thing you're going to want to do is to actually split your integrals. First, recognize that it's improper either if you see an infinity on the limit or you realize your function is going to be undefined somewhere on that interval. And all of that can be happening simultaneously. What you first want to do is using this property, break that integral up so that only one point is a bad point on the integral. Set up limits for each integral approaching the bad points. Um, 
use a different, you do not want to mix and match these uh, in, in limits. Use a different variable for each limit. Because each uh, for each of these integrals, you're setting up your own separate Riemann sum, so you don't want to re reuse any variables here and kind of confuse things. Now, third, uh, you're going to integrate as you normally would. Then, you're, and then after doing that, uh, take the limits. Then, finally, you can make some conclusions. So, and you pretty much do things in this order. One, two, three, four, five. So here are the conclusions. If the limit, or of course some of the limits, to a finite number, we say the integral converges to that number. Okay? So there's the notion of an improper integral converging. And that's pretty much once we go through this process, if we set up the limits, we take limits, we get an answer two. We can say, oh, this integral converges to 2. Meaning, in theory, if I were to do an infinite Riemann sum to try to measure the, what this function is doing on an infinite interval, uh, I'll actually get a finite answer. And if the limit either does not exist or, oh, let, let's, be, let's be a little bit more specific here. If any one of the limits does not exist or is plus or minus infinity, then we say the integral diverges. <coughs> what I want you to do here just practice breaking up the integrals. Then we'll do a problem. Let's do some examples. Mechanically, that's all you need to know to actually solve a problem. But we're going to go through some specific examples. And we'll get to some applications later. You'll see more applications in future classes. Uh, examples.
I guess you can like not look at that and then do it again. Part of the view, leave you guys on a cliffhanger with these, um, but let's actually try to get through the first example. So for next class, you can try the other integrals that I left you with for using um, the Weierstrass substitution, and then uh, we'll deal with these guys next time. So let's look at example one. Can probably do these in real time. How would you actually break this guy up? With that integral from um, negative one to zero of one over x dx plus the integral from zero to one. Right, uh, zero is a bad point, that's where we're undefined, and we can split it up, so that's the only bad point, and it's exposed, and it's only exposed once per integral. So, otherwise on this interval, we're fine, so that would be that. Um, yeah. <coughs> one to infinity, one over x dx. How to break that up? Is it infinity to zero to actually? Yeah. Is it finite space? Is it what? Isn't it finite space? Yeah, do nothing. <laughs>
There's only one back point here that's infinity. It's already one back point for integral. It's exposed. But what about 0 to infinity of 1 over x? 0 to 1. And then you go from 1 to infinity. Uh, D. What about this one? Okay. So we're getting the idea of that, this phase of the, uh, the problem. <clears throat> so that would be our, the first step here. And then you begin the, the uh, phase of actually computing this integral. And what you're going to do is, maybe I'll show you with the other one, and maybe you can take a stab at these if you have time and you're uh, interested enough. Uh, so here, so that's an exponential function. Uh, in the power, there's a polynomial, so that's defined everywhere. The only problems are the infinite ones, so I can go from minus infinity to zero plus zero to infinity. In theory, whatever number you pick in the middle doesn't doesn't actually matter as long as your function is defined there. Uh, this one uh, we looked at it; it's going to be minus two to minus one. Plus, say, minus 1 to 0. Plus uh, 0 to 1. Plus 1 to 2. Now, write down how you would actually continue here. If I ask this. Now f is a very, at a very extreme case, I'd say, for talc 2. It's very rare something's going to break up into four parts, or more than four parts. Not that it can't happen, but I, I probably won't ask you, because you know, I wouldn't want to have to grade it, um, to continue f. Here's how you'd actually start. Uh, you identify the bad points, and they're all exposed. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to use limits to approach each of these bad points. So that would actually break down into, uh, you'd use a limit, say, of L approaches minus 1. And here you're going to do from minus 2 up to L. Plus, now you're going to set up another limit, M approaches minus 1 from M up to 0. Plus, you're going to use another limit, say N approaching 1 from 0 to N of this guy. Plus, uh, O is going to look weird, so let's skip to P. Limit as P approaches 1 from the integral of 1 up to 2. And a lot of times it won't matter, but sometimes it will, so you can get a little bit more specific. Notice here that I would actually approach the minus 1 from the right side because I'm I'm lower than 1, I'm increasing towards 1 from the left side. Whereas here, I'll approach it from the right side because I'm larger than 1 and decreasing down towards it. Uh, here, I would of course approach it from the left side, and here I would approach this from the right side. And so sometimes knowing the, the left and the right can make a difference. I'll, many times it won't. But Should that be a P in the last integral? Yes, where the 1 is, that should be a P. 
So the idea is, uh, as I said, you're going to now just do this integral as you normally would. Apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. You will have the N in your answer, as well as the L, or the M, or the P in your answer. It will be a part of your answer. Once you have that answer, then you take the limit of that answer. And what you're looking for for this one to work is that each limit should give you a number. If any one of these limits don't give you a number or they shoot off to infinity, you say the whole thing diverges. Otherwise, you say this original integral converges to whatever that sum of the numbers are. So we'll stop there. We'll pick up some more abstract examples and the rest of these next time.